Welcome to another episode of Digging for the Truth. I am excited. I've wanted to do an episode over Israel for a good long while, but I have somebody here with me today that is an expert, truly a historian, and truly somebody who loves researching and loves the people of Israel, and I cannot wait to introduce you. We will be right back. Well, welcome to another episode of Digging for the Truth. I have with me today a history teacher, but also a researcher and lover of, I think, all things Israel. Tell me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. I'm right. Yeah. Well, I'd like to introduce Courtney Crowley. Um, and Courtney has some has recently kind of come into my path. Uh, and you at the church recently taught, I think, about a four or six week? Six week. Six week, okay. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a series on Israel, the Jewish people, why we should care, and some things of that nature. And anyway, um, your parents showed up at our life group um, for another reason. In fact, I'm having them on a podcast on the very next podcast. So y'all are going to want to check that out, too. It's going to be really neat. Um, and we got to talking, and I got your number. And I said, hey, you need to come talk to the audience here about Israel. And so, first, let's let's talk, learn a little bit about you. So, you are a history professor, is that right? Yes. Okay, at WT? At WT. And so, what do you teach down there? Uh, pretty much anything they need taught. I teach American history, early and modern. I do contemporary world history. Uh, and then my specialty is Israeli and Jewish history. So, I have a course on that. You do have well. a course down there mm -hmm. on that? I do. Man, I, when I would, was in college, if there had been something like that, I would have yeah. loved to have taken him. One of my favorite professors down there when I went to WT was actually in history. He was a neat guy. I can't remember his name, though. <laughs> but he was, but he, I, I really remember I enjoyed his class. Um, okay, so you kind of grew up in this area, you I know, did. in the Amarillo yep. area. So tell me when you decided that you were interested in the things of Israel. Um, probably happened when I was around the age of four or five. Um, my dad would read to me. Every night, we learned all the Old Testament stories. Uh, and then he read to me the book, The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Oh, wow, yeah. And One of the heroes of our faith. Absolutely. And I remember as a young child being touched by the story, but also being completely perplexed by, you know, why the Jews were being singled out the way they were. And little did I know at the time that was a seed that stuck with me, grew slowly throughout my, you know, youth. I'd always trend towards reading books on Jewish history. Uh, and when I got to college, any research project that I did, I wound up doing it in some you know, way with the Jews. And then my senior project, I kind of discovered, well, by gum, all of it moves past the Holocaust in World War II into Israeli history. And so from there, I did my graduate studies on the subject. And then WT made the foolish decision to ask me to stay and teach. <laughs> and uh, so it kind of grew from there. I didn't really mean to do it necessarily, but I can see the hand of God uh, pulling me and pushing me in that direction. And I'm very thankful that he did. So. Well, I'm thankful that he did too. And I'm also thankful that there are actually teachers like you um, in, you know, higher education, because that's something that's actually very lacking. I know uh, just through the grapevine that you are persecuted here and there. Sure. But uh, you stand your ground and you stand it with honor. Uh, you stand it in a very godly and biblical way, but I think it's actually a testament to things we need to do as a nation to not back away from the fight, but to be engaged in it absolutely the right way. Yeah, and, and when you are engaged with it and you don't back off, it gives God an opportunity to move on your behalf, and it's always shocking and stunning and always precisely on time. Never what I thought it would look like, but it's always so much better. So I consider it an honor to deal with those problems because that means I must be doing something right. Oh, there's no I'm question. making the people mad. So it's it's fun in its own second twisted kind of way. Well, it is, but, you know, here's the thing. Jesus says, you know, he told us that, you know, if the world hates you, they hated, they hated me first. Right. You know, and unfortunately, we live in a very, I mean, we're definitely way past, you know, a Christian nation. But, you know, we now I think we're, you know, it's even more than humanist. I mean, we're now that people are starting to talk about transhumanism and all this crazy stuff. Right. Um, but anyway, so it's important to make sure that we stand our ground. It's Absolutely. the only truth there is. Sure. Um, so I asked you, 
You set a record. I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, know. <laughs> you're an overachiever. I'll give you that. Um, I always ask, hey, listen, if you have some slides, if you have some scripture, send them to me. And, and by golly, you did. You didn't just send me some scriptures and some slides. Uh, you sent me a lesson plan. Well, it can't be helped. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a complex topic. And honestly, for one of the first times ever, I'm actually letting you kind of take more of the, the reins here. We actually have an outline we're going to kind of stick close to because there's, it's, it's, it's something that we need to talk about kind of chronologically. Yeah. And I think it needs to be done in that order to help people kind of understand. Absolutely. So really, the, the, whole, the whole topic today, you know, that we're getting into is, you know, um, why we should care about Israel and the people of Israel. And if you're, before we start talking about any of the end time stuff and, and, and people kind of want to jump sometimes straight in the deep end, first we need to understand who are the, the Jews. Right. Um, and and we'll talk about some, you know, some of the basics of Israel. And then maybe in later episodes, we'll talk about some of the more complex things. Um, but I think, so what we did today, you sent me a list of things, and I kind of put them in question and answer format um, when it's all said and done. And so I hope you don't mind, but... Uh, Let's see here. So question number one, why should Christians care about, the, especially as the church, but Christians in the church, why should we care about the uh, state of Israel and Jewish people? Well, it seems like a complex question, and it's often treated as such, but I think the answer is really simple, and it all goes back to what does God care about, mm -hmm. and just even the... You know, quickest glance at the Bible lets you know that he cares about Israel. And oh, he cares from about the very Jewish beginning. People. So it seems pretty obvious that, well, if this matters to him, then it should to us as well. Um, so it's as simple as that. But I wanted to kind of take it deeper and look because as Christians, we should love Israel. But we should also take an incredible amount of inspiration from Israel and God's uh, faithfulness to them. Not just through the biblical period, but throughout history. Um, because there are people who have been persecuted ceaselessly, and yet they still exist. And you can't say the same thing about any other ancient culture uh, or people. So it's a testament. It's a tangible testament for us to see. So That's a great word. And that's absolutely true. Right now, especially as a church, as a Christian, um, we've never been persecuted. I mean, I, I, when I grew up, I mean, we were the, still, you know, a, a very Christian nation. Right. Right. And... Uh, I've got a few years on you, but even you growing up, I mean, I believe that you probably would say the same thing. Absolutely. And quickly, I mean quickly, the world has just turned its head uh, upside, been just turned on its head. And, and and now that, just like what the scripture says, that which they call evil, they will call good. And that which is good, they'll call evil. Um, and so this is not a new thing. Um, the, the the Old Testament, the, the Israelites, I mean, they went through, think about all the prophets that came and spoke. So there's always been trial, but God is, this is a phenomenal testimony to us because mm -hmm. there's history that says, listen, God does not leave his people. Right. He may prune us. <laughs> and he often does, yeah. And he often does, mm -hmm. but it does not leave and abandon his people. Exactly. So that's a great, a great point. Okay, so you've sent me quite a few scriptures, uh -huh. and, and we don't have to go through all of them, but I think just for, for people that, are, are going to say, all right, well, where's the scripture? Let's look through some of these. And we don't have to spend a ton of time on them all, but I think this right here is a great place to kick it off, what you sent. Absolutely. So it's in Malachi, or as we call him in our family, the uh, Italian prophet Malachi. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Malachi, yeah. And that's theologically <laughs> accurate, by the way. Um, but it talks about, you know, the Lord is speaking. He says, I do not change. And that is such a simple yet profound statement. And we often forget, but... The God of the Old Testament, far from being the, the angry, vengeful sort of God that a lot of people think he is, nothing could be further from the truth. He's loving, he's faithful, he's tender, he's compassionate. Uh, and that same God is the same God in the New Testament. That's right. Obviously, through Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Um, and, of course, he talks about it in Hebrews as well, saying yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So that's a really simple thing to bear in mind not just for our own faith, but for the story of Israel itself and the Jewish people. It's the same God throughout eternity. He never changes. He doesn't have to change, uh, and he doesn't change. Well, that's an important point, and, and that might be one of the most important points. I think a lot of people think that, first of all, and I don't want to get too deep, but a lot of people think, you know, hey, well, the God changed from the Bible. Well, the God, and there's, no, there's no expiration on any scripture. Secondly, from Old Testament to New Testament, the only thing that changed was the covenant between God and his people. Mm -hmm. Okay? Law, 
and grace. And I'm simplifying it, but that's basically it. God did not change. Right. Um, the, the avenue in which we can come to and before him did. Um, and so that did not also, just because Messiah came, doesn't change, you know, uh, the, his relationship with his people, which I think we're going to get a little bit more to that. Um, so you also mentioned, which I thought this was great, God and his heart in Hosea. Yeah. So I love the book of Hosea. It's a beautiful analogy for God's relationship with Israel and then with us. It's a marriage story. Uh, and it's a story where the husband is faithful and the wife is mm, not. Is not yeah. um, and I think we all fit that bill in our faith and Israel as well. So it talks about in Hosea 6.6, 6, uh, it says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, which we often forget. We always try to you know, earn that grace, yeah. and that's not possible. But then he says, and he desires the knowledge of God rather than uh, burnt offerings. And in the Hebrew, that knowledge of God is deeper than our concept. It's not simply that I know God, you know, like I know you, I know that guy I passed on the street. It's when you look at the Hebrew, it's da'at Elohim, and it's an intimate um, marriage sort of knowledge. And what it means is what is important and critical and really at the center of my heart should be at the center of your heart. And at the center, or as he says later, the apple of his eye mm -hmm. is Israel. If we want to have an intimate relationship with God, we should care about what he cares about, and that's Israel. That's the whole point of Hosea, and that's what he's meaning here. And that's what he yearns for, is for us to love what he loves. You know, I want to go ahead and point out, too, is just I sh there's several scripture in regards to Hosea. You kind of gave the fuller picture, but also if you'll see on the screen there, it's Hosea 2, 19 through 20. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would encourage you, if you've never read Hosea, um, the first time I read it, I was like, that's kind of depressing. <laughs> you know, it, you know, it, I didn't really get it. Um, I was a young Christian, and I was going through the Bible, and I got to Hosea. I was like, did y'all know there's this guy <laughs> that God <laughs> told him to marry a prostitute? And I thought, <laughs> It's not an easy calling. My word, no, it's not. But anyway, it, it, but it is a beautiful love story in regards to God's love for us Absolutely. and what he's willing to endure, you know, even though we are complete adults. You know, sometimes. Right. And uh, anyway, so I guess let's just kind of like I said, we're doing this question and answer kind of format. So why should Christians in the church care about Israel and the Jewish people? It's a really simple answer. It's because God does. Yeah, it's um, because God does. That's it. It's We complicate matters so very well in, in the church, uh, but it's simple. And if you love God, you love what he loves. He loves us. He loves the church, but he also loves Israel. Uh, and he put it there to serve as sort of a test to see how do we treat Israel because they're a physical representation here on this earth of his covenant, his promise, his truth in the word. And if we honor him, we will honor whom he chose, the Jewish people, and where he chose, which is Israel. You know, I think it speaks also, every, everything you said is, I, I completely agree. You know, God tells us, you know, about respecting authority. And if we can't respect his authority and those whom he's given authority to, then, you know, we, we, it all breaks down. Um, the people of Israel, um, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. You have these questions in order. I was fixing to jump to a, a future stick point. To the lesson, I'm going to stick. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I was fixing to get off the script here. All right. Yeah, boy. You need the ruler to slap my I wrist. Do. I'll tell you what. I left it in the car. I'll tell you what. Well, question number two then. Mm -hmm. Why did God choose the Jews? I'll let you begin. Okay, well, this is a tough one I found for Christians because there's oftentimes this feeling of discomfort and I would say even envy to an extent of, well, you know, they're the chosen people, they're better, you know, then we feel kind of jealous about that relationship. But again, if we know the character of God and the purposes of his will, we understand this. He chose the Jews because he needed somebody to work through to reach and redeem humanity because after the fall there's a separation of course he needs to find somebody he can work through through mankind and so he had to pick somebody and obviously we know from Genesis he wound up picking Abraham um, which is kind of an interesting choice given his background <laughs> you know, right. he's not an idol maker he's in you know, the Ur of Chaldees you know he's well, well he's probably living right next to potentially with ta d definitely the ziggurat of Ur, but mm -hmm. I mean, so a, a Tower yeah. of Babel replication potentially, yeah. Right, in this metropolitan place, he has a life, he's settled, and, and then he does the crazy thing and he hears this unseen God and he answers the call. So we know he moves and follows God. Uh, and then when he does that, 
God comes and meets with him, and he kind of outlines and clarifies that calling in Genesis 12, which is really an important passage for us to know if we want to understand God's relationship with the Jews and Israel. Um, and in it, you can see God's heart. I'll put it back on the screen there, but yes. Yeah, there we go. I didn't memorize it. So <laughs> All right, let me, I'm, uh, the test time, let's so, go. So yeah, it says the Lord said to Avram, so this is before he's been named Abraham. So this means exalted father, but he's not the father of multitudes yet. I says, go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. So here's this childless man being told, I'm going to make of you a great nation that requires a great deal of faith. And I would probably say a pinch of crazy as well to buy into it. So he follows it. And so God continues. He says, I'll make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him that curses you. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. And just those three scriptures, you can see God's heart on display. He needs to pick somebody, but his ultimate desire here is to bless. Yes, he's going to bless Abraham. He's going to bless his descendants, but he wants to bless the world as well. But therein you can see the test. Because for those who do not bless Avram and his descendants, but instead curse them, then there's going to be a curse involved for them. Because this is a model of God, his plan in the earth, his sovereignty in the fallen world that humankind has mm -hmm. messed up. So I think it's important to always bear in mind what is God's heart, and ultimately it's to bless. So he had to pick somebody. He picked Avram. So that's the first step. You know, the thing that's interesting about this period, so I've, I've, done, I've done some things on the podcast, but I've done a research. I've done some research and done some teachings about just the, the period, so the antediluvian period, you know, before the flood. And I, you may know this, but and I've, I've actually said on this podcast before, but what's crazy is well, when Abraham was called, there were, there were people pre-flood that had been there. Shem actually was still alive, mm -hmm. Noah's son. In fact, Shem outlived uh, Abraham mm -hmm. by 75 years. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, by 35 years, by 35 okay. years. And what's crazy, when you look at that, if you, so, so Shem, somebody who saw the, the, the fall, okay, yeah. before the flood and how fast man falls away from God, he was a contemporary. Now, there's, there's, there's some, you know, extra canonical texts that you can go and read that kind of give a little bit more insight where, you know, he actually may have had, you know, who knows, all that you take with a grain of salt, but had encounters with Shem and Noah, but I, I don't mm -hmm. know. But the one thing we know for a fact is based off of the scripture that's canonized is that these people were there. And so how quickly man falls away from God and falls into hedonistic and selfish ways. Right. And so here's Abraham in the middle of it. God saw something in him. Clearly there was something in his heart that didn't probably set right. He didn't know necessarily maybe why, but sure. and then God pulls him out and plucks him out. So, I guess then we kind of comes down to why did God choose the Jews? And, and I really kind of like the way that you put this. It's really a three-part answer. It is. Um, to reach humanity, yep. you know, we needed, the, you know, the scripture, but to reach humanity through the Bible. My favorite part right here, mm -hmm. to redeem humanity. Exactly. Yeah, he needed to reach them through the Bible, the written word. So we need to have somebody, and that's going to be the story of the Jews. And then the Messiah himself, redemption, is, of course, Jewish as well. Uh, so quite simply, without the Jews, without Abram following the call, uh, without all of his descendants living according to God's plan and covenant, we wouldn't have the Bible, but we do. And then, of course, through that, we get uh, the kings of Judah and ultimately the lion of Judah himself, Jesus. So it's all, that's the ultimate purpose there is to reach us, to redeem us through the Jewish people. Well, and the third part, I like the way you said this, was to demonstrate his unfailing love. And you you went on, you know, to actually say their perfect fidelity and absolute trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I thought, and I absolutely, uh, I liked the way that you put that. So, <clears throat> we're in a fallen world. Um, Abraham, you mentioned something you said a minute ago, which is kind of interesting. So, he definitely was not a perfect vessel. Um, right. if, if you research and study Abraham and his life, Abram to Abraham, um, boy, he did a lot of silly things. The one that bugs me the most uh, is how technically Sarah was his sister. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's a little messy. In there, it, right? it gets a little messy, mm -hmm. but then the fact whenever he got it already pulled them out so many times of trouble, and they would go into new kingdom, and he say, "Tell them," because she must have she must have been really good looking. I, you know, oh, we can assume that. Yeah, that's from the scriptures. <laughs> but he says, you know, just tell them that you know you're my sister. 
Um, you know, so there was a lot for God to work out there too. Oh, absolutely. Uh, in him. And, uh, so anyway. Yeah, I think that's an important point to, to illustrate though, is the fact that yes, they're the chosen people, but they're an imperfect people and that's okay. And when we look at, you know, the Jews modeling God's unfailing love, that's when we see it play out over and over again is they continually screw up mm-hmm. and it's easy to point their faults out, you know, we have our own as well, but God never gave up. That's true through the biblical stories, and that's true in the post-biblical period as well, because there is absolutely no reason on earth for the Jewish people to still be around. There's absolutely no reason that Israel should exist as a country, and yet it does. Wait, wait, we're talking about that. You're, you're, you're jumping ahead. Um, I'm a, well, I, I built that in. Oh, oh okay, all right, all right. But all I right. think it's, it's important to see that that's a testament for us, and we can take inspiration from that, is that's the whole point of choosing somebody, and he chose the Jews. You know, which whenever I was uh, kind of new to the faith. So May 22nd, 1994 was uh, the night that I received Jesus Christ. And I'm, more, I'm not going to get into that too much now. But I remember after that, I was very hungry for the things of God. And so I, I began in Genesis. Like, well, where do you begin? So I started reading in Genesis, place, yeah. you know, and um, I was kind of like you, I, I think. Um, I was, I wished that I could go back and live in those times. You know, of course, now I look back and I'm like, those are some really rough times to live in. Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. And, and it's some really tough times to live in now too. But um, but I, I was always intrigued with them. Um, I don't know that personally I ever felt jealous of them. I already knew my salvation. I knew enough to know that Jesus himself was a Jew, the Messiah. He came mm-hmm. and he came for all humanity. Um, he did that which the Jews had not done, which was to extend the, the, the branch to the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. And invite them into the fold. So anyway, I I understood that. So when I read these stories, you know, especially, you know, I, I think Abraham, well, actually, I, I tell you what, Noah, that one kind of, but Joseph, I, you get down the genealogy and Joseph was probably the one that really set up camp in my heart. Mm-hmm. For a good reason. He's an excellent person. And he, because I just, I looked at how persecuted he was um, and, and then yet how God in the end, he became the second most powerful person in the world. And so, anyway, I, I, just, I love the Jewish people. And so, th- the book of Genesis, if you've never read the whole thing, just read it. Uh, well, Exodus 2, you, gotta, you, you can't quit. you got to go to get, jump into Exodus. Um, numbers is great. Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you're going to want to jump out the window. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so we're, we're talking about all these Jewish people, um, you know, in historical context. But we say now, well, the Jews— it's kind of a generic, well, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. Well, how can you be Jew and how, what it makes a Jew? Well, I guess that's new, new, the next question really is, who are the Jewish people? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's probably the most complicated question on the list. And um, there has been debate for ages and ages still going on. So there are a lot of misconceptions about who the Jewish people are. So I want to focus on terminology first because, you know, in the church we talk about the Israelites, you know, know, here it is, the Hebrews as well. So we're looking at the biblical period. So when we're talking about them, we're talking about the patriarchs. Uh, We're talking about Moses. We're looking at David and Hezekiah. Um, We're looking at, obviously, Jesus, Paul later on, right? All of these figures, they're Jewish. They figure into the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, But they're part of the same people that we refer to as the Jews today. So that's just the root there that we need to bear in mind. But there's always different terminology that's being used. But the Israelites, the Hebrews, we're talking about the Jewish people. They're the ones who are part of the covenant that God made with Abraham. They follow the the Torah. They have their customs and their rituals. But they've been chosen to live out his plan in his life. But after the time of Christ is when there is a catastrophe right. um, with the, the Romans who come in and they destroy the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. So this is the central hub of Jewish culture, religion, life, uh, and it's been desecrated and demolished. And the Jews, by and large, not completely, but by and large, have been expelled from the Holy Land and from the promised land that God gave them. And this creates a kind of a crisis for the Jewish people because, well, who are they now without... Jerusalem, who are they now without the temple? How do they practice their faith 
without that location geographically speaking. And so we see that there's this dispersion. It's often called the diaspora, where the Jews move throughout the world. Many go to Europe. Um, many go into the, what is the Middle East, in North Africa. We'll see go up and where is Russia, even over to Asia. So they're spread out. And then the question becomes, well, how do they maintain that Jewish identity and culture uh, without being right there together and without the temple itself? And this is when Judaism, right, the faith of the Jews, begins to adapt. And we see that new customs come into place. And you kind of have to figure out how to do this religion thing now. But the thing that's always so amazing to me is how the Jews maintain that culture and the lifestyle in the communities. They're very insular, and they protect themselves from the outside world. They value things that the outside world doesn't, like education. Uh, they train all of their children, males and females, to read, to learn, to study. And now it's, I don't want to just skip over that. That was an incredibly um, diverse thing back in that period. We're talking about dark ages. Absolutely. Uh, um, when, you know, I mean, if nobody read, they didn't really understand education. It was, the world was predominantly illiterate. Exactly, except for the Jewish That's people. Right, yeah. um, and so you have this diversity of people now speaking different languages. They still study in Hebrew, but Hebrew is not spoken on a daily basis anymore. Uh, they're speaking the languages of their new lands. Mm -hmm. They you know, speak Yiddish or Ladino or other Jewish hybrid languages, but they're still maintaining that identity. Yes, they pick up different customs depending on where they are in the world, but they're still Jewish, and they maintain that throughout the centuries um, until we get to the modern era where, and I know we're jumping ahead a little, but we'll come back. All right, all right. Um, is that you have the Jews who begin to talk about once again returning to that promised land. And so now we have Jews who are Israelis. And what's important to know is that not all Jews are Israelis. I get that question a lot. There are many Jews in America uh, and throughout the world. Not all Israelis are Jews. About 70, 75 percent of the population is Jewish, but you have Arabs Christians uh, and other well. groups, Christians. Yeah, well, and atheists. I mean, actually, there's quite a few, Right. I'd say even secular Jews, but yeah. Secular, but they're still Jewish. Jews, right, yeah. um, and so one of the things we see, the easiest way for the rabbis to kind of define who a Jewish person is, is through lineage. And so the legal definition of a Jew is one who's either born to a Jewish mother or who has officially converted to the religion. But here's the thing that I really want to stress, because this is a really big misunderstanding, is that the Jews um, are not a race as we think about it. They're not even necessarily a single nationality as we understand it in the modern world. Being a Jew, it's more of an ethnic community. It's not racial. Uh, and that's important to know because this racial concept is something that we'll get from anti-Semites themselves, most notably Nazi Germany. But I put up this picture here because this just shows you different groups within Israel. They're all Jewish. They are all Israeli because they live there, but notice that they don't all look the same. They have different customs and language, but they're Jewish. And when I'm in Israel and I look around and I see these different groups, all that I can think of is what a beautiful representation of God's diversity and that they don't fit one singular mold. It's a variety here, but they all belong and are part of the chosen people. So it's difficult I know for Christians, particularly in this part of the world where there's not a large Jewish population, mm, to understand yeah. who are the Jews, what does this mean? Uh, Israelis, Israelites, all these different terms. Um, it's complicated, but they're Jewish, and, and you know, in a community sort of way. I think uh, some of the stuff gets, and I don't really want to get into it on this particular episode, but when you refer to uh, the twelve tribes. <clears throat> and we begin to look fast forward to Revelations, okay, the 144,000 and a few right. things like that. That I think that's where people who are more interested in the end times and things unfolding as it relates to the Jews as it comes to lineage. Mm -hmm. I think that's where things maybe get a little fuzzy, but I, I, I agree with you. Um, so let's just, you know, we need to pop up that, you know, that last answer there, though. So, you know, they're not just one single race or nationality. Right. And I, I think that, uh, you know, that is uh, really important. I remember as a kid, 
you say there's not a lot here, and there's there's really not. Um, but I, well, I guess when I was in the first or second grade, there was a kid, um, and he, they were Jewish. And so I remember we, you know, I went over to his house. They had a Hanukkah party, his birthday. I remember seeing all the, you know, just the menorahs and, and everything for the first time. Uh, I was also introduced to nothing for this particular episode. It's kind of, it, it was, it was uh, not good stuff, and, and it had nothing to do with faith at all. And so, but that was my first encounter um, with. Uh, the Jewish people, and I was, I remember having lots of questions, and I mean, I didn't get those answers at that time. I was like, well, what, so, yeah, what's a menorah, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I didn't understand the Star of David, and, and the people around me basically communicated as best they could, sure. um, but anyway, I, I think, so that, that actually kind of planted a seed in me a little bit, it's like, hey, Jews are right here in my community, so I think God let me have that experience early on, and mm -hmm. ironically, they were all, they were redheaded, yeah. You know, uh, the, the, the family is all redheaded. So, all right. Well, question number four, um, I think is actually one that is probably, I think out of everything on your list is probably the most talked about right now. Sure. And that is, why does the world despise the Jews? The rise of anti-Semitism. Um, you spoke a minute ago just about Hitler. I'm actually a big World War II buff. I watch almost every day some type of documentary in the evening when I'm going to bed about World War II. Um, Must have interesting dreams. Well, sometimes, <laughs> actually. It's amazing. Uh, I, I had one about submarines the other night. Well, so, sure. But, you know, it's the, the. I think I was just intrigued with how it relates to how a group was so segmented and cast out, but also how such crazy people could get in charge so fast. Mm -hmm. And, and then I, you lay those parallels over – to today. I think that's probably my biggest interest today is you have these crazy people in these different segments and histories of time. And what's interesting to me is that the Jews kind of always end up right dead smack in the middle of it. Absolutely. So I'll let you kind of take it from there. So first of all, just a basic definition of what is anti-Semitism, because you'll hear it and we don't really define it. It's quite simply just hatred or prejudice of the Jews, Jewish people, Judaism, etc. Um, it's old. It's been around since the story of Exodus, right? And we can see it uh, throughout the Bible. We have Haman who goes after the Jews in Persia. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't stop. Even after the Jews are dispersed, they've encountered horrible uh, types of anti-Semitism. Often, I'm sad to say, at the hands of the Christian church itself. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that, I don't excuse it. It's wrong. Uh, we should support the Jews, they are brothers in the faith, um, but it's not been treated that way. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that Jewish culture, as I said earlier, it emphasizes character, education, life, and family life and community. And so when non-Jewish or Gentile society is struggling, and you say the Dark Ages or in other periods of time, you look at the Jews and they're educated and thus they're successful. Um, they live a healthier lifestyle, and you look, I know you can fall asleep reading Leviticus, but there's a lot <laughs> in there about health, hygiene. 610 laws that the Orthodox Jews, or 603, right. they, mm -hmm. they, I think there's a total of 613 laws. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah. I have trouble with speed limits, so <laughs> I never mind. But yeah, so you have the Jewish people who just, they're the proverbial other. They live different, they look different, and they're more successful, generally speaking, and so this has led to immense prejudice, and oftentimes the Jews have been used as the scapegoat. Whether we're talking about the Black Plague that sweeps through Europe, and the Jews are going to be blamed for that, and they said that they're poisoning Christian wells. It's insane, yeah. yeah. It is insane, and that's a pretty mild example. We'll see coming from the church things like the blood libel, which is particularly heinous, stories that Christians are told that the Jews go out around Passover— find an innocent Christian child, murder them, and use their blood to make the Passover meal. Mm. Which this all this did was stir up, hatred. obviously, hatred and violence mm. to the point where we get the, what were called the pogroms, which were mob attacks on the Jews. We see destruction. We see lives lost. And it's at the hands of not just the political elite, but also the church itself. Um, the Jews, and some of these are still alive and well today. Um, Jews said that they make too much money. They have too much influence politically. Uh, all 
un, you know, false. Yes, they're more successful by and large, but they're not controlling the world banking. Um, they don't control the wealth and make the rest of us poor. But these are deeply embedded anti-Semitic ideas that we see showing up nowadays on Twitter, on Capitol Hill, I'm sad to say. Uh, in Europe, anti-Semitism is on the rise, and well, in America, too. Not just America. It's, it's actually becoming a... Uh, in Generation Z, um, so this this young generation, <clears throat> because of all of the horrible, so you know, I'm in technology, um, and I go and I speak and I teach about just the dangers of technology, and especially social media and, inter- and just th- this live interaction with just bad ideas, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and the, and the lid's been taken off of evil. People no longer try to conceal it or hide it. It's just out there for everybody to see. So the ideas, these m- these bad ideas in regards to who the Jews are. Um, is here, here's, here's the sad thing though, even here in America, the Christians now are also kind of being put in this category. Um, I feel like we ought to say this too, you know, so when she talked about just, uh, you know, that there's an image here, I think that, that we ought to pop up and, and just, you know, the, the people who are speaking against the Jews, you, you made a comment, there's many Christians these same Christians, I'll go ahead and say, they're the same ones that hold up the signs and go, you know, to gay pride parades and say God hates, you know, whatever, the, mm-hmm. the, the word. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, and here's the thing. God hates sin. He hates sin, sure. period. Um, but he loves people. And as the church, um, you know, as God's people, you mentioned that through all these very bad periods of time, they, they found success. Well, it's because they adhered to a faith. And think about what the scripture says. I mean, I remember um, when you're speaking on apologetics, things like that, you know, whenever they would circumcise a baby at eight days old, science now backs up as to why that was important. Um, and is because of the prothrombin and, and it was, is the highest level, which is just a, a healing agent in the body. Well, when you start looking at the other 600 and <laughs> whatever, right. r- r- you know, th- mm-hmm. it was really, it was, it was for spiritual, physical, and, and financial, all these different health. Right. Well, remember when he called Abraham, he said, I will bless you. And that's the key component of the calling and the covenant is blessing, not just the Jews, but us, if we'll accept it. Um, When we don't, when we curse Israel and the Jews, then, well, we're cursed, as he said. But it's a blessing component, and the Jews have been blessed. But as is the way in our fallen world, those who bear the name and the mark of God and follow his covenant and are blessed, will be despised for that. And that's that's the key thing right there is it's just uh, they don't like God. The world doesn't. And, well, the Jews represent God in many ways. And so that's why they face hatred. They do. I, w- I want to go ahead and, and bring up the scripture, though. You know, it's just in Isaiah 41. Um, you know, we, we don't have to read it all right now. But over and over and over again, it says, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, seed of Abraham. I mean, he's, these, are our, these are chosen people. And, and kind of go back to the previous question, you know, about feeling jealous of those who are chosen. Um, you know, the world that we live in, they, have a, they, they kind of combine three religions, which is completely wrong. Um, they say that Christians and Jews and Muslims all serve the same God, which is absolutely not true. The only two that fall in any alignment at all, Period are Christians and Jews. The Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, they're, they're the same. And if you, as a Christian, were to walk into uh, a synagogue someplace, you would feel safe. You would feel like, hey, you know what? I, I feel presence of God. I mean, I, it, it's, sure. it, that's the difference. And so these, these are our people. Um, and that's another reason. Listen, we need to stand up for them and stand shoulder to shoulder with them as the world hates them or comes against them. The world's also hating us and coming against us. Absolutely. We need to jump in the same camp and fight together. Yeah, just because we're despised doesn't mean we forget about the others who are being despised. I think we need to remember that. But yeah, we need to stand in support. I like that scripture from Isaiah because as we'll see is that God always is reminding the Jewish people of his faithfulness and goodness. So yes, they have faced hatred throughout all of history, and yet his promise is still alive and well. He is still faithful, and he's always speaking to them. And you can see this, and we might talk about it at some point later, is that anytime there's a momentous event that occurs, particularly in the restoration of Israel as a nation, we see that the Torah readings for that week are speaking directly to what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. So God is very much alive. He's very much involved with the Jewish people and with his covenant. And for Christians... 
it's not just that we support Israel and the Jews and we love them. Obviously, we do. But more than that, I think if you are in your personal life struggling, wondering well, where is God in this or why haven't I seen a miracle in this department and you begin to lose hope, it kind of ebbs away, all you need to do is look, look at Israel, the Jewish people. That's and say, a good word. My goodness, look at what he has done. He's never let them go. They have faced things far worse than we can imagine, and yet here they are. Well, that last part of that scripture, I, I really like that. I uphold you with my victorious right hand. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and, and I think that's something that, you know, it is encouraging. It is. You know, you, look at how long they've existed, yeah. and, and they're the only, the only group, you know, yes. that, well, let's go, let's go to the next part, because actually this is probably... My favorite part. Okay. Well, I don't know. I said that, I think, on the last one. I, don't know. I, didn't, I didn't say my last one was a favorite one. I said it's probably the bigger, one of the bigger questions. But this is something that intrigues me. I've taught on this, but God's role in the modern Israeli state. So before we even get real deep into this particular question, we have to talk about the modern state. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 37. Um, what happened? So you, you spoke a moment ago um, about uh, the, the, in 70 AD, the destruction of the temple, uh, the Jews are dispersed. Okay, this is prophesied over them, in you know several places, but even in Ezekiel, and it says they're going to be scattered to all the nation to all the nations. Absolutely, and that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So before we kind of jump into the next segment, so is this is you talk about encouraging. So you're saying, well, look at what God's done for them over time and time and time and time again. Okay, the Scripture. Okay, which you know, it, it, written you know roughly over 1,500 years, 40, 44 authors roughly. Okay. And, and it all lines up. They're dispersed through all the nations, okay? You know, nearly, what, 1900 and something years, 1900 years go by, mm -hmm. okay? Yep. And then Ezekiel 37, Israel is formed again as a nation yeah. in a day. Yeah, it just takes a day, you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> to make a nation, right? <laughs> exactly. This, to me, is one of the most profound pieces of scripture modern day like if we're looking back at thing right now things going on in the world as it relates to uh the scriptures prophecy jesus you know mm -hmm. the return come on jesus i'm ready <laughs> all right it, this is it and so i think that um this happened you know in 1948 and it happened in a single day and, and i want to hear what you have to say i i, I have a few things that uh, i'll probably follow up with on this in regards to becoming a mm -hmm. nation in a day so yeah so we have the jewish people late 1800s they begin to speak up dealing with anti-semitism and they say you know what maybe it's time to have our own nation again and this is running parallel to other nationalist movements and so jews begin to leave predominantly from russia but other parts of europe as well and move down into what was at the time called palestine I want to stop for a moment and talk about the name Palestine. Mm -hmm. I hear that a lot in the media, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Palestinians. Well, it's never been Palestine. That's not a biblical name. That's something that the Romans gave the land essentially to erase any Jewish legacy presence there. So it's not an appropriate or an acceptable word, but it's thrown around a lot to delegitimize Israel. Anyway, so the no, Jews... No, I'm glad you pointed that out. That's really good. It's important. So the Jews begin to move into Palestine. It's controlled by the Ottoman Turks, long-standing empire. There are Arabs living there, and that's important to acknowledge. Um, but it was not a thriving place at all. In fact, it's kind of like the backwater yeah. armpit of the empire sort of thing. Uh, and when the Jews return, talks about it in Ezekiel 36. We see the promises laid out even when Moses was giving his farewell address of sorts in Deuteronomy 28 through 30, I think, explaining how when you follow the covenant and you follow my ways, I'll bring you back. And the land does begin to Come awaken. Come back alive. And it's remarkable to see. It's through hard work, but it's through God's blessing as well. And so through World War I, the period after, the Jewish population begins to grow while at the same time, you know, the enemy working through the Nazis most notably, try to stamp out the Jewish presence once and for all. And it's in the wake of the horrors of the Holocaust where we see that God moves in and he's going to open the doors in miraculous ways to allow for the Jewish people to declare statehood in the land, which happens in 1948 um, in May. But I think you wanted to talk about it as we see 
God working and moving in so many incredible ways, and which is my favorite part of history. Is you can look back and mm-hmm. see. You see, oh, you, I know what you're doing now. Yeah, you know? yeah, it makes sense now, right? It does. And so, one of the most notable things is that the United States and the Soviet Union, so we're into the Cold War at this point, they're both going to recognize the legitimacy of a Jewish state. So the two world superpowers do it. Now the Soviets are going to, you know, change their mind pretty quickly. Yeah. But nonetheless, it's legitimate. The United Nations, so all of the nations gathered together, likewise issue their recognition. So the world is saying, it is yours, you, the Jews, now the Israelis, it's your country. Um, but after that, that's when all of a sudden the world turns its back on Israel again. Uh, and it faces... And it did not take long at all. No. Um, I believe the first shots were fired within minutes of the declaration. Um, and you have all of these Arab armies coming against this tiny... We have 600,000 Jews in Israel. You now have people who have survived the Holocaust coming. They land in Israel. They pick up a gun, and they immediately go and fight. So they're leaving the camps. They're malnourished. They're dealing with this trauma. And all of a sudden, they're fighting. Many of them die, wind up in unmarked graves. Nonetheless, they survive. It's miraculous. Uh, But one of the things that grieves this new Jewish state is they don't have Jerusalem yet. Uh, It belongs... Maybe not legally, but it belongs to Jordan after the 1948-1949 war. So there's still that separation, and there's not that fulfillment yet. Because it's important to know is that Jerusalem is the chosen city. God made a covenant with David that this is where I will put my name, and it will always be where I put That's my right. name. So, and it's being well, it's being contested even as we speak. And ironically, uh, the United States um, and and the Biden administration is kind of in the middle of this, even denying, you know, uh, East Jerusalem, you know. So, in fact, I believe Biden and his administration went over there recently, did not speak or communicate with a single Jew, mm-hmm. spoke with the quote-unquote Palestinian, you know, authorities there. Me, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so that was a blatant attack of the United States, which is ironic because, you know, one of the people that, you know, had to exist for Israel to become a nation in a day mm-hmm. um, happened to be Truman. He was the first person to recognize Israel as a state, if I'm not mistaken. He was. I think for a moment, let's stop and acknowledge Ben Gurion's excellent hairstyle. Uh, Oh my gosh, he looks like Einstein. It was in. It was in. It was in. You know, know, I tell you what, though. Okay, as a guy who doesn't have any hair, if that's all I could do, I don't. Hey, he pulled it off. He did pull it off, and he he was he was a neat guy. He had to be a very strong man because he, as you mentioned, uh, came into. The nation, um, I mean, a brand new, newly formed nation, and the world turned its, well, you said turn, the world turned its back. Well, actually, I'd say they may have turned their back, but they turned their armaments towards them. Oh, absolutely. And and so in the area of the things of Israel, uh, so real quick, I, I want to back up just a minute. You know, we talked, we just touched on the Holocaust. That's another one of the things where they, the world denies the Holocaust. I mean, that's another thing. That, oh, it didn't really happen. Well, six million people would beg to differ. Right. Oh, well, six million Jews would beg to differ. One of the great ironies is that the Germans were excellent record keepers, so we have records and solid proof. But yes, uh, ignorance of the Holocaust is growing at uh, a marked and concerning pace, even here in the United States. I think last time I looked at statistics, maybe about 27% of American high school students were familiar with the name Auschwitz. So that's, that's it. That's it. So that just goes to show you how... Um, dangerous of a time we're living in, but it's ignorance and it's poor education as well. Oh my gosh, it's poor education or re-education. Right. Yeah, so you you have the Holocaust, then we have Truman. And Truman, you had his picture up there, he is worth celebrating for a moment. Uh, because here you have this man who's selected as vice president for uh, FDR. And FDR is in his fourth term. And he picks this guy in order to kind of win some more votes in the Midwest. Um, but he doesn't ever consult Truman. They spend no time together. Truman No, they is, were not friends. No. Um, but, of course, FDR dies in April of 1945 before the world, world War has ended. And Truman comes in. And poor Truman had a terrible first day in office uh, because once he's taken that oath— you know, then his administration or his cabinet comes in and says, by the way, we have an atomic weapon that we're developing. Never heard of that. But Truman was specifically picked by God. He I agree. grew up reading the Bible. He was a self-proclaimed Zionist, which is someone who supports Jewish sovereignty in Israel. 
Uh, his best friend from childhood was a Jew. So he came in knowing and understanding the importance of the Jewish people and the promised land. And he was always determined, particularly in the wake of the Holocaust, to recognize a Jewish state. Um, and so he kind of makes this declaration that, yes, I will support you before we actually get to statehood in 1948. Uh, and the State Department and most of Washington works as hard as they possibly can to undermine him. Uh, they release official statements saying, no, the United States will not support a Jewish country. Uh, Truman was furious at that. Well, that, that was set the precedence from his predecessor. Oh, absolutely. So FDR was, uh, you know, if you, I don't want to get too far into this, but FDR, he was, he was anti-Semitic. You could, there's no way they put him. In fact, there was a book written by um, a rabbi. There was Rabbi Wise. I want, it's not Samuel. I'm gonna, I forget his first Amen. name. Stephen? Okay, I knew that's something to that effect. And he was actually kind of the emissary of the Jewish people to FDR. But FDR, he'd invite him to the Oval Office and do these things, but it was all lip service. He did nothing. Right. In fact, he, he was caught saying, you know, the Jews should just keep quiet. And there's actually a book to that effect written that says the Jews should just keep quiet. Um, and so <clears throat> FDR, um, he, he had vocally, publicly stated that he mm -hmm. will not recognize or support uh, a Jewish state. Yeah. And, and the people that were left behind in the cabinet, Okay, are the are the are the hard spots that Truman inherits? Right. Yeah, it's important to note that the Washington establishment has long been anti-Jew and pro-Arab. Um, you know, they'll say it's mainly because of concerns of oil, but I think it goes far deeper than that. I would agree. But yes, FDR dies, and it's important uh, to note, and I think this is an amazing fact that on the desk in the Oval Office when he dies, a book was opened, uh, and it was a book about the land of Palestine and how it could be revived. Uh, and made viable for a large population. And it talked about the Jews potentially being mm. those people. Um, I'd never heard that before. Yeah, uh, you, you can always see God kind of working in mysterious ways. So FDR is gone and Truman comes in and facing incredible resistance. He, he ignores the establishment. He breaks with protocol and he does recognize Israel. Uh, I believe it was 11 minutes after the declaration was issued in Tel Aviv. Truman recognizes the state. And this is a monumental moment. And I don't think it's unfair to say that he is a modern representative of the Cyrus leader that we have that's a good, in the Old Testament. Yeah, that's a good way to put that. And in fact, Truman, after making that decision sometime after, he uttered the words, I am Cyrus, because he understood that he had a calling on his life to recognize Israel and fulfill that role. I'd not heard that yet either. And he, he was put in there just at the right moment. Well, and it just shows God's perfect timing. Absolutely. I mean, perfect timing. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. Yes, he did inherit a lot. So real quick, I mean, so you, you mentioned Zionism. He, he was a Zionist, but then there's also the anti-Zionist yes. uh, group. And so mm -hmm. you want to maybe speak to that just for a moment. So anti-Zionism is pretty much just a trick. It's essentially another word for anti-Semitism. But in the wake of the Holocaust, it's no longer acceptable to be anti-Semitic. So you have to find a workaround, and it's, you're going to be anti-Zionist. So oftentimes they'll criticize the state of Israel, um, couching it in anti-Semitic terms, but saying, well, it's, you know, we're just criticizing a country, not a people. But anti-Zionism is highly problematic today, and you can see these images. These well, are Netanyahu, modern. Palestinian flag, I presume, you know, yeah. burning the Palestinian people. I mean, this is the rhetoric is incredible. Right. It's fever pitch, the things people say, and flat-out lies and disprovable, but still. Sure. Yeah, so you have him putting in the Palestinians in the Auschwitz crematoria, so you're bringing the Holocaust imagery. Same with the one in the top. Uh, we have the swastika and you have never again with the jews and over again you have a gazan palestinian um so now in the wake of really the cold war you're going to hear a lot of statements about israel it being uh, a racist state and this is why i emphasize so much that the jews are not a race you can see that when you look at the different absolutely groups. Yeah. but any detractor of israel and the jews is going to say they're a racist state and thereby they're illegitimate uh, they're an apartheid state and coming from South Africa that separate. If you've ever vi visited Israel, you know that's obviously not true. I have not, but I can't tell you how bad I yeah. want to go. Well, we'll have to do a field trip. I would this. love to go. Um, and we also see uh, Zionism is often equated with Nazism, which is particularly heinous. Lots of these... You know, charges are made, but anytime you hear anti-Zionism, you need to stop and think, is this 
really just criticism of Israel as a country, or is this truly anti-Semitic? And more often than not, it's going to be the latter, in that it's just hatred of the Jews in Israel using different terms to make it sound reasonable. Well, Israel did become a nation in a day, and God, his hand is sovereign. Absolutely. And you cannot move the needle, you know, any way other than what points Israel, the, the Israelites back to their country right. and their city, um, which is, which as you mentioned, yeah, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And, you know, I think that at some point, uh, we're, we're, I definitely want you to come back. We need, there's so much to talk about here because mm -hmm. we're looking at the Dome of the Rock. People always look at the Dome of the Rock and they, there's a lot to talk about there. There what, is, yeah. Yeah, and, and what we're looking at. Um, but there's, there's just the, 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 the people of Israel, who the Israelites are, why we as Christians, you've done a phenomenal job. I've learned a lot today, actually. Um, so you can come back and school me oh, again. Thank you. Um, I'll try not to get out of order next time. Yeah, I hope not. Um, but th this is there's just so many so many important pieces um, to the puzzle in regards to even understanding our own faith. Mm -hmm. As a Christian, if you want to know more about your own faith, you need to understand who God says the Israelites are, right. who God says the Jews are, who God says we are in relation to them. And, and anybody who's a Christian and has any anti-Semitic stuff on your heart, I just want to go ahead and tell you that you were saved by a Jew. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. Um, but. Is just is there anything you know that you 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 want to mention or close on? Um, you know, I didn't really give the answer, but you know, what does God have to do with a modern state of Israel? It's pretty simple. It's everything. Yeah, His fingerprints are all over it. Um, we can see that in '48. We see it in 1967, where you know He allows Israel to win a war in less than a week. I know. You know I was about to say, days. yeah, in days. Yeah, um, embarrassing all of their enemies. Um, much to my glee, it's rather funny. Yes, yeah, I agree. Well, and then also, if you watch any documentaries and, and listen to testimony from them, the, just the the miracles that God did. So yeah. God, it was it, this was a sovereign. I mean, God was in the middle of that war. I mean, they talk about things that happened that are incredible. The only God could have done. Even the the the, the Israel, you know, uh, soldiers were there, oh, yeah. and they're like, well, "Well, this is what we saw. We couldn't believe it, but this is what we saw." The so. stories of the of miracles on the battlefield are truly remarkable. They are. Um, but I think going back to your question of anything else, I just really want to hit on the fact that God chose the Jews and he chose Israel out of his great love for us and because he wanted to communicate with us in many different ways that we can see. And it's easy to overlook if you're not paying attention. But the whole point is to see that he is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of our love and our faith. Because he is always faithful That's as right. he has exhibited time and time and time again for the Jewish people and for Israel. And the covenant that he made all the way back in Genesis is still alive and well today. And I think it's in Jeremiah 33 uh, where he talks about it. <laughs> my, my tablet <laughs> is trying to listen to you, well, I guess. That happens when yeah. I lecture. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted to finish with this because I think it's beautiful. And again, he's, he's using terms that we can understand here. Uh, because he says, thus says the Lord, if any of you could break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night would not come at their appointed time, only then could my covenant with my servant David be broken. Last time I checked, the sun came up this morning. It did. I have a feeling it will go down this evening, and we'll start the whole process over again. And I don't think you can be any clearer in saying that the covenant is still alive and well than using that example. The covenant still holds. The covenant with Israel, with the Jewish people, with Jerusalem. But we're a part of that. We've been grafted in mercifully into this story. We should marvel at it. We should stand in awe of everything that God has done. And we should do everything within our power to support the Jewish people, to support Israel through prayer, any other means, financial or otherwise. But we should be alert to what's happening and realize that this, this problem of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, it's only going to worsen, just as the persecution of the church is only going to worsen. We're comrades in this story. We are. And, and we should accept that and be thankful for that. I know... The Bible talks about rejoicing when we're in times of hardship. Easier said than done in the moment. <laughs> right. But it's an honor to be where we are and to see this story play out as we get to watch it in these end times. I love your faith. You said something there, and I, I just can't leave this alone. 
that we've been grafted in. And actually in Romans eleven seventeen and 18, it says, Now, if some of the branches were broken off in you, although you were of the wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and became a share of the root of the olive tree's richness. That's speaking specifically to we became a share of the chosen people that God has you know, had his hand on in the beginning. So in, and it goes on to say, though, do not boast against the branches. In other words, speak against right. the Jews. Don't do it. And But if you boast against them, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Absolutely. You know, I just, I, that's a great scripture that I think lines up specifically with what you were referring to. But anyway, I just, I can't tell you. First of all, I'll, thank you so much for coming on okay. here today. I've learned a lot. Um, and <laughs> And I hopefully, you know, y'all have as well. You know, there's just... Listen, I, if, you, if you're not familiar with Israel or uh, you're not familiar with just the history of the Jewish people, I would encourage you, just go back and start reading in Genesis. Get through Genesis and Exodus. And, and then just there's so much material. There's lots of things that you can look at online. Uh, TempleInstitute.org actually is one that talks about the, the things that's going on in the new temple and, and so forth. But just we just encourage you to, to learn more and love on and pray for uh, our brothers and sisters in, in the state. The, the Jews and in, in the state of Israel. Um, well, again, thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, it's been an absolute joy and an honor, and I can't wait to have you back soon. Cool. Next week, we're going to be actually interviewing her parents. Uh, completely different topic, though. <laughs> Neat family. Anyway, we've enjoyed having this conversation with you guys, and we cannot wait to see you on the next one. See you next time. <laughs>